G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and today I'm going to show you how to use Dynamo in order to align your MEP fixtures back to link to ceilings. I'd like to thank uh, Rajesh uh, who actually gave me the idea. Um, we worked through another problem together um, over LinkedIn and he mentioned that he used a workflow in order to place MEP fixtures onto ceilings and I thought this was great because I'm aware this is actually a problem. Um, I know that architects love to move their ceilings and they don't tend to like to tell engineers they've done it. <laughs> um, so I'm very much aware that this is a challenge having worked as an architectural BIM manager and having heard many complaints from MEP uh, engineers working with us. Um, so I have thought it'd be good to find that workflow as well and sort of show you how to do it. Uh, so the goal is that we really just want to have a big button that we smack it and everything goes back to the ceilings from a linked model. Um, so it is um, important to note that these aren't necessarily going to be face-based families. I'll touch on that in a sec. But this is the goal. So misaligned from ceilings near, nearby. So the architects raise their ceilings a few hundred millimeters, which is quite common. It's pretty rare that we lower our ceilings and give you more space for your ducts. Um, it's quite common that we push it and then expect you to fit later. <laughs> um, but essentially we're going to line up to the ceiling face. So I guess a question here is what type of families should you be using? Uh, Face-based families or level-based families? Typically, I think a lot of engineers I know who work with good architects who use BIM properly can get away with using face-based families because you can host an element to the face of a linked element. However, a lot of the time I know a lot of engineering firms have actually said internally, we don't use face-based families because we can't trust our architects to keep their ceilings where they are. We'd rather see that discrepancy and understand it's a problem. So a lot of the time people actually use a standard level-based family and they input an offset control into that family or they use the, the, the base offset command that comes with uh, MEP fixtures by default. So I'm going to be using two nodes from the Bimorph package today, the intersex solid and the link element of category node in order to process the linked ceilings. Um, but without further ado, we'll get started. So um, we're using Dynamo 2.0.3 in this demonstration, uh, but let's jump into Revit. So you can see here, I've got a, a ceiling from a linked model and I've also got a bunch of uh, registers. Um, I'm not just going to do like six registers because obviously you get no idea of how much speed it could take to do a big model. So what I'm going to do instead is focus on an entire model. So if I turn off my section box, this is the scale of what I'm dealing with. So we've got multiple floors. This is actually coming from the Revit architectural sample model. And then I've actually raised and lowered a lot of the ceilings to achieve different ceiling heights. What I've done then is just made all my uh, air terminals in this case sit at 2.1 above their host floor. So you end up with a lot of misalignments between ceilings and elements. Um, so we're gonna find a way in Dynamo to bring these together again. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna start off by picking a category of elements. So I'm just gonna expand Dynamo. And let's just get the categories dropped down. So you could do every single MEP fixture in your model all at once, but I think it's too fast and it will take too long. Um, so I think it's better to review them category at a time. So I'm gonna just do a category drop down instead. I'm then gonna get an all elements of category. And this will get all the elements in the live model. Um, it won't get any elements in linked models, obviously. Okay, so now we should get all of those as elements, which we do. Um, we've got quite a lot of them in this case. It's important to note that I'm getting air terminals and not all of them belong to a ceiling. So that's quite important to point out. So if I just turn off my temporary height isolate, and I believe I've got a filter on as well. I've set up a filter to hide all the wall hosted grills. If I turn this back on, we actually have a lot of wall terminals like this that don't belong to a ceiling. So we need to find a way to filter them out of the, the terminals we're dealing with. Um, usually the way I recommend doing this is by inputting some data into your families. So in this case, I've added a type comment or a description to these particular types, telling them whether it's a wall or a, a ceiling host. That way we can just focus on our ceiling hosted elements. So I'll just jump back in Dynamo. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the element type because this is a type property, not an instance property. So we need to actually review the elements type parameters instead. So we're gonna get parameter value by name. And we're just gonna look for that description. So we'll get parameter value by name. And actually we, we use type comments in this case, but you could use any field essentially. So we'll get type comments. And what we wanna do is we wanna check if the type comment contains a particular word, in this case, ceiling. So we're gonna use a string contains because the parameter value comes out as a string. So we're gonna check of all these types and note here, I've got ceiling host and wall host as my options. Uh, we only want ceiling. 
So we're just going to make a little code block. I'm going to search for ceiling and we will ignore case. And we're going to use this in order to filter out our elements to only get our ceiling host elements because we should get a list of booleans that we can feed into a filter by boolean mask. So I'll just get a filter by bool mask and I'll filter my original elements based on whether their type contains ceiling in their name. So this should limit down the number of air terminals we're dealing with. So you can see now we should have an in list, which is what we proceed with, and then an out list, which we don't want to. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is continue with this. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the location of all of those, all of those registers. So get existing elements location. And if I run this, we should get a whole bunch of points. And in Revit, each of those points should be sitting upon each of these registers. So if I just quickly check here, I don't know if we'll be able to see it. I think I've turned off a category that shows them. Uh, it might be generic models that shows that, I think. No, I'm not sure, but there is a category that shows you Dynamo Preview Geometry. At the moment, each one of those points represents the origin of that family. So it's the bottom of the air terminal uh, at the moment. It's important to note that these are the default families that come from the Autodesk sample model, and they've all just been offset instead of being made face hosted. So this workflow only works for, for non-face based families. So what I'm trying to do is modify the offset parameter to match the ceiling height above it. So I've got the element location. What I want to do with these is I want to make some geometry that I can clash against the nearest ceiling and then interpret the, the height of that ceiling. So what I'm going to do is just generate some spheres in this case. So I'll just do a sphere by center point radius. There's other ways you could generate geometry. This is just one way. Um, what I'm gonna do here is just get a number for the radius of my sphere. In this case, let's just do a meter and a half because the, the fixture could be above or below the ceiling depending on where the ceilings went. So it's important to make it just big enough that it grabs nearly every ceiling with confidence. Um, that's quite important. Okay, so at this point we should end up with a whole bunch of spheres. One for each, each air terminal respectively. And these could be lights, these could be fire sprinklers, they could be any element that has a point-based location. There we go, so now we have all these spheres. So what I'll do is just turn off, I might keep the preview for the spheres on for now. What we need to do now is get all of our linked ceilings. So this is where we start using the bimorph nodes package. So what we need to get first is a linked element of category, because we want to get all of our linked ceilings. So of category is what we're looking for. And what it asks for is a link instance and then the category. So I'll just go and get a select model element so that the user can just select the link that they want to deal with. So I'll just go select and I'll pick my link as my element. And we can just call that select link. So that's my link instance. That's how easy that part is. Um, from there, we'll just get a category by name. And this is just so we can get the ceiling category. And you pretty much treat this the same as you would a standard category by node workflow. So we'll just search for ceilings. And now we should get all of our linked ceilings. If I run this. And it will get them as link instance elements, um, which can be dealt with by particular nodes, but not in the exact same way you deal with an element. What we are going to do with them is run them against a intersect solid from the biomorph package. And the way that this node works is you give it a whole bunch of solids and a whole bunch of elements, and it will tell you, it will give you a sub list for each element or solid that clashed with those link elements. So we're gonna take our spheres and our elements, and we're gonna clash them against each other. There we go. And we should get the sub list out of our element. There will be some that may not have a ceiling, in this case, we're going to manage these out because they'll end up having an empty sublist for the uh, the clashed elements. You can see it takes a little while to run this part. Um, it's a fairly intensive workflow. There you go. So you can see we've got ceiling, ceiling. Sometimes we have more than one ceiling that are clashed with. Um, so in, the, in each of these cases, we will just take the first ceiling. What we're going to do first is just find all the ceilings that have uh, no clashes. So there will be some of them. And what they're going to have is they're going to have an empty list. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get parameter value by name. And I'm going to get of these linked elements, I'm going to get their height. So I'm going to get their height offset from level. So I'll just do height offset from level. Make sure to get the case correct. 
and we can get the parameter off the, each of these linked ceilings. We should be able to, except for the empty lists, they'll stay empty. There we go. So now you can see that they've all been converted to their height offset. Um, you can see there's a few empty lists like these ones here, for example, because these ones have no ceiling in their room. So what we can do now is check for the, the ones that are empty. List is empty. And we're going to check if those lists are empty. And we're going to use this as a Boolean mask as well in order to manage out those particular ducts or um, air terminals. We need to run this as a longer slicing as well, sir. And then we're going to get two filter by Boolean masks. Because we should have a list of trues and falses. And we want to get rid of these empty lists out of here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to get my, not the sphere, I'm actually going to go and get the duct itself or the air terminal. So I want to find all my air terminals that uh, do have an actual intersection and all those that don't. So I'm going to, so I'm going to filter by list is empty. And then I'm also going to filter this list. So the parameter values by the same mask. And now we should get an in and an out list for both of these respectively. And our in list will be the ones that do have a ceiling they clash with. Oh, sorry, our out list will be our ins. You can see we have three that have no have no um no match, and then they'll they'll be empty lists as well. So now we've managed those out. Uh, but the next thing we need to do now though is we need to deal with the actual uh, parameters before we process this. So we need to get the ceiling heights, which we've done, but we then need to get the first ceiling because some of these will have more than one ceiling they clash with. You'll see, sometimes the list contains two. We just want to get that first ceiling that it clashes with, because um, maybe there's a bulkhead or something like that. Um, it's up to you how you process this part. I'm just going to do a very, a very basic check at this point and just do a get item at index. And I'm just going to say that for my list at level two, I want to get the, f the first item. You could get the last item. It depends on the trend that you're finding in your list of which one actually is the ceiling that you care about. But this will pick up a majority of those situations. You could also say, uh, what is the maximum item in each of my lists? In fact, maybe we'll, maybe we'll just do that. Maybe that's safer. Yeah, we'll do that. Let's, uh, actually, no, it could be minimum item. It, it probably takes a bit of review depending on the model. Um, you could reduce the radius of your sphere as well if you're picking up too many elements with your sphere. It just depends how far apart you think that the elements and the ceilings will be from each other. So I could reduce the, the distance between these um, quite a bit. I could say maybe only a thousand instead of 1500. And then we may get some more that don't have a match, uh, but we're going to order those out at the end and review them. So maybe we'll try that instead. You can see it takes a little while to rerun because it's running the intersection, which is quite a, quite a heavy process. It's almost like running a clash detection. But once it runs, all of these things should get updated. There we go. And these should be the heights that we want to set these elements to, uh, at least in the majority of cases. So from here, we just need to get a set parameter by name. And we're going to take the elements in our out list here. And we're going to take these values and the parameter name that we want to set is their offset. Let's try that again. So we want to set the offset parameter. Um, and But we also want to check the ones that didn't find a match because you want to visually review those probably. I'm just going to freeze this for now. What we're going to do is just use the element override in view. Let's just make it a highlight in a particular color. That way they can see that some of these didn't find matches. So we're going to override all of these elements in the in list. And I'll just set this to longest lacing. And we need to set some overrides now. So we're going to do override graphics by properties. So there we go, override graphics by properties. It looks like a very complex node, but it's actually an out of the box node, this one. Cool. So we're going to feed these overrides in here. And probably we only really want to do two things. We want to get the fill pattern for solid, just to make them have a solid pattern on them, and then change the color of it. So we'll do fill pattern get by name. Oop. 
Try that again. Get by name. And this will be our projection fill. So it will be our projection fill pattern. And the name that we want to get is going to be called a uh, double apostrophe. Let's go get it on my screen. And we're going to do close triangle solid fill. Close triangle. That's what the default solid fill is called. And we also want to get a color as well to override. So we'll just do color by ARGB. And we get our projection fill color. And let's just do 255 for alpha, 255 for red, and zero for green and blue. That way it's just a, a red. Uh, warning, if anything, we could do maybe orange. Orange is a bit more, a bit more friendly. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so now we should be able to run this script, and it should work. So what I'll do is I'll just save, and I'll pull this off to the side so you can watch the elements adjust. I'll just sort of shift down so you can see them move. So let's run the script. And we should see these offsets all update to match the ceilings in a majority of cases, at least. Cool. And now we can see all of these are now flush to their ceilings, um, except for the wall terminals, of course. So I might just filter those out um, using my filter I've set up. Cool. Um, but there you go. You can see that pretty much all of them, except for a few, found their ceiling host. Um, and then it looks like most of them, the first item in the list was the right one to pick. They look flush for the most part. So that saves a lot of time, obviously. And here's the ones that we can see didn't find a match. And we can see why. It's because there's no ceiling in these rooms. So that makes sense. Um, so it might lead to the question of, you know, is an air terminal meant to be in these rooms? Um, we can obviously see other ones here as well. You can see that even though there's no ceiling in this room, it actually reached out and found the nearest adjacent ceiling. So sometimes that might not be the most ideal workflow. Um, you might sometimes want to instead intersect a, a cylinder moving directly up and down from the center of the terminal. That might be a better workflow, that you're, so you're only considering the vertical intersections instead. Um, but a sphere is just a really quick and sort of dirty approach, I guess, to forming an intersection. Um, but there you go. So a really interesting workflow, and I think there's a lot of potential to improve on it. Um, so hopefully it gives you some ideas of how you can develop your own workflow. And thanks again, Rajesh, for telling me about the workflow. So thanks for watching today. Um, hopefully you found that useful and hopefully you're enjoying seeing some more MEP focused videos on the channel. Um, whilst I'm not an engineer, uh, I'm an architect or an architectural BIM manager. Um, I think it's great for me to explore some of these techniques because it helps me better understand my engineers that I work with as well and helps give more techniques to the engineers I work with too. Um, so if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. I make videos about twice a week and plan to do so for a very long time. And hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, take care.